1948, a book was published that sparked the sexual revolution. Unnoticed within it were the details of the sexual abuse of several hundred children. Who were these children? Who were their abusers? And how did the world's most famous sex scientist come to use the details of these sexual assaults as evidence of children's sexuality? <music> Professor Alfred Kinsey was the father of the sexual revolution. From 1948 to 1956, he traveled the world, advising governments how to modernize antiquated sex laws. From Britain, where he advised the Wolfenden Committee on Homosexuality, to Europe and America, his advice was key to updating sexual attitudes. In 1948, Kinsey published the first scientific study of what people do in bed. Sexual behavior in the human male took the world by storm. When the book came out, it simply hit America. It was compared to the atom bomb. Um, people were rushing out to buy it. It sold something like 300,000 copies for a, a book almost twice as expensive as the ordinary book and certainly five times as fat. All the papers had it either in the front pages or very, very big in the, in the middle pages. All the magazines, Lifetime, had six or seven page spreads about him. Before Kinsey, America had a schizophrenic attitude to sex. No matter what they did in private, in public, its citizens adhered to a strict moral code. The only sex that is sanctioned by society and its legal uh, strictures in the 20s and 30s is sex between people who are married. Uh, and even then, there's some interesting you know, uh, and arcane uh, laws uh, about even husbands and wives. Uh, one of my favorites is from North, Northfoot, Arkansas, that. Uh, Man and woman, even if they're married, mustn't laugh while they're having sex. Because, you know, that's uh, sex is serious business. Oh, the sexual climate in those days was, uh, well, to put it gently, repressive. <laughs> uh, everything was illegal except wet dreams. <laughs> and so, well, if you had premarital intercourse, that was uh, labeled fornication, you know. If you had extramarital intercourse, that was adultery. Of course, homosexuality was taboo completely. So was animal contact. If you tried petting, you had to be very careful of the age of your partner or you would be contributing to the delinquency of a minor. You also had to watch your techniques. If there was any mouth genital contact, by definition, that was sodomy. You know, so, uh, literally, uh, as Kinsey once said, if all the sex laws were rigidly enforced, about 90% of the males would be felons. <laughs> Kinsey's book challenged most known views on sexual behavior. From masturbation to adultery, homosexuality to bestiality, Kinsey's patient research appeared to reveal the reality of America's sex life. We took sex, you might say, out of the closet. We made it possible to discuss sexual matters in the home, uh, in the office, in schools, and even in the media. We sort of broke the uh, taboos the research was based on the biggest survey of sexual attitudes and behavior ever undertaken. Kinsey invented a highly detailed confidential questionnaire. His researchers had to learn the complicated code which encrypted both questions and answers. Paul Gebhardt was a senior member of the team. Uh, frankly, it was a damnable thing to memorize, and Kinsey forced us to memorize it. He wouldn't let us keep a little... Uh, little guide or cheat sheet or something. We had to memorize it verbally. Uh, it was a sheet of paper divided up into columns and lines. And each column dealt with one subject. For example, one column uh, dealt with the frequency of intercourse in marriage. Another column dealt with masturbation. Another column de dealt with uh, psychological responses to sexual stimuli, etc. Another thing he did was always to assume that people had done everything. It was never... Um, have you had sex with a pig? It was when, when was the first time you had sex with a pig? And as one of his, um, 
interviewees said, uh, if you hadn't had sex with a pig, you were fine, but if you had, he'd got you. He was in the market for everything. His interview system was so flexible that if you happened to surprise him with something, turned out that you were a hair fetishist or something like that, he would stop and go off on that uh, tangent and explore it to the nth degree. But there was a dark side to the research. One chapter in the book dealt with the previously unresearched subject of child sexuality. It's little known that to get this information, Kinsey cultivated relationships with habitual child molesters. These paedophiles would provide him with accounts of their abuse of children and with their own interpretations of children's sexual development. At the beginning of his research, uh, Kinsey saw pedophilia as really beyond the pale. As he collected more and more data, and as he, uh, again, hoped to promote more and more tolerance, he has a hard time maintaining moral boundaries. In June 1944, Alfred Kinsey left Indiana on an 1,800-mile trek across the southwestern United States. He was going to a clandestine meeting with a man who was to become his prime source of information about child sexuality. This individual was, uh, I suppose you might say, sex. His interest in sex was his main hobby in life. <laughs> Anything was, <laughs> was a sexual object for him. He was interested in having sex with men, women, and children, and animals. And he just was curious to see what would happen. His first sexual contact was overt intercourse with his grandmother. His, um, he had looked up his family tree. There were 30, uh, I forget how many, 33 or 38 members. He had had almost all of them. Um, he had had intercourse with hundreds upon hundreds of males and females of every conceivable age. My memory is that it's a, exceeded 600 for both boys and girls, and we haven't yet got to maturity. The man was a US government land examiner called Rex King. To protect him, Kinsey gave him the code name, Mr. Green. His job took him across Arizona and New Mexico, trips he used to prey on children. He molested at least 800 boys and girls, recording the details in explicit handwritten diaries. Kinsey was told about Green by his own mentor in sex research, Dr. Robert Dickinson. Dickinson had collaborated with the paedophile for several years and taught him how to record his child abuse in scientific detail. He told him how to measure things and time things and, uh, and encouraged him to, uh, he knew he was going to do his uh, ordinary behavior anyway. Dickinson couldn't have stopped him from being a pedophile. Or, but he said, at least you ought to, uh, you know, do something scientific about it so there'll be, it won't be just your jollies, it'll be something worthwhile to science. So he gave him some training by uh, letter and correspondence. experimented with baby. Penis 1.7 inches by three inches. Stiff immediately. Throbs in 3.5 minutes. Green's diaries were a highly incriminating record of 20 years of sexual abuse. But Kinsey was tantalized by the prospect of so much unique data. I congratulate you on the research spirit which has led you to collect data over these many years. Everything that you've accumulated must find its way into scientific channels. Kinsey worshipped 
data. Anyone who could contribute to his aggregate data had a very high place in his you know, pantheon of, 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 of heroes. And when Kinsey learned about this material, uh, he saw it as a gold mine, as a scientific gold mine uh, that would provide information uh, in an area about which science knew very, very little. Kinsey met Green at a secret location in Arizona. Because of the illegal nature of their contents, Green had buried many of his diaries in the desert. Kinsey persuaded him to retrieve them and pass them on to him. Green had been a predatory child molester for more than 20 years. So why did Kinsey agree to work with him? Clarence Tripp was one of Kinsey's closest associates. Even today, he defends Kinsey's involvement with the pedophile. Green was actually extremely conservative in all kinds of ways, and we know that for sure, because he had, um, you know, you can get into trouble in a flash if you have any kind of, uh, uh, even uh, tickling, any kind of sexual contact whatsoever. Um, with the child because all you need is one whimper out of the child. You don't even need a formal charge to put you in the jailhouse. Well, here's this man with hundreds of contacts. There was never a charge against him. He was never arrested for anything. All the children thought he was wonderful. Uh, all the mothers thought he was wonderful. Uh, there are two, I suppose, lest uh, you get contradicted, there are two instances in which a young boy or girl, a girl, I guess it was, I don't remember, um, didn't complain. They agreed to the sexual contact, but then they found it very painful and yelled out when it actually took place. This was because they were very young and had small genitalia, and Green was a grown man with enormous genitalia, and there was a fit problem. For the next three years, Kinsey corresponded regularly with Green. In 1948, he would publish large sections of Green's diaries in his first revolutionary book on human sexuality. But rather than presenting them as the claims of a self-confessed child abuser, Kinsey put them forward as the first ever scientific proof that children were sexual beings from birth. When, in 1948, Alfred Kinsey's sexual behavior in the human male became an instant bestseller, no one seemed to notice the contents of chapter five. In it, Kinsey reproduced sections of the pedophile diaries he had received from Mr. Green. First, and with no independent corroboration, he published verbatim Green's detailed descriptions of what the pedophile claimed were orgasms experienced by the hundreds of children he had abused. Extreme tension with violent convulsion, often involving the sudden heaving and jerking of the whole body, groaning, sobbing, or more violent cries, sometimes with an abundance of tears, especially among younger children. If you read those words, what he's talking about is kids who are screaming, kids who are protesting in every way they can the fact that their bodies, that their persons are being violated. Uh, the individual in question, uh, I think, uh, harmed uh, in serious ways uh, a large number of young people. Green had also carried out what he claimed were scientific experiments to determine the age at which boys were first capable of orgasms. For the experiment, he masturbated 317 infants and children from two months to 15 years old, recording which ones achieved what he interpreted as orgasms. 
Kinsey reproduced this as Table 31. In Table 32, he laid out the time it had taken Green to bring each of these children to these so-called orgasms. Green also claimed that his experiments proved that, given sufficient adult stimulation, some of the boys were capable of multiple orgasms. Again, with no way of checking the claims, Kinsey simply reproduced them as scientific fact. Finally, in Table 34, Kinsey set out Green's notes on the time it had taken him to masturbate the children to multiple orgasms. The average interval between the first and second climaxes ranged from less than 10 seconds to 30 minutes or more. Even the youngest males, as young as five months in age, are capable of such repeated reactions. The table suggested that some children, including a four-year-old boy, had been masturbated over a 24-hour period. In his book, and based primarily on Green's information, Kinsey claimed that children could, with the assistance of an experienced adult, enjoy sexual activity from the moment they were born. It was a revolutionary claim that overturned all previous scientific knowledge about the development of child sexuality. But the claim and the experiments that lay behind it have alarmed Kinsey's critics, particularly those who campaign for a return to traditional values. We have a whole chapter here in which children have been tortured for this so-called scientific data. And this is the calculations of those abuse data into tables to promote this as scientific to the world. An assessment of these data suggests that at minimum 317, at maximum 1,200 and some, boys were being sexually raped around the clock using stopwatches. Because of its illegal origins, Green's material was a closely guarded secret. Only a trusted inner circle knew of its existence. It was illegal, and we knew it was illegal, but uh, it's very important for people to study childhood sexuality. In other cultures, anthropologists can sometimes do this, but in our culture, it was uh, because of our insistence that children are non-sexual, uh, studying childhood sexuality was essentially impossible, except, you know, for this case like Green. And uh, so he, he, had a, he contributed a fair amount to our knowledge of, and when I say our knowledge, I mean all, medi medicine's knowledge of sexuality in children. You know? But some of Kinsey's team questioned both the morality and the scientific validity of using the material. Well, when I saw the table on, on uh, time to orgasm, for, uh, when infants are, are stimulated, uh, carried out to the a fraction uh, of, of a second, I, I thought it, it was an absurd page in science. But to actually stand there with a stopwatch and have somebody or oneself stimulate uh, the infant and time it to the split second it was simply uh, so gross that I didn't, uh, I didn't f feel it, it, it had a place in, in, in a scientific book. Remember that Nolis, uh, who I've never met, was, um, he's a very upstanding kind of man. He was damaged in childhood with all this morality. And then he had this um, uh, peculiar moralistic wife, or I'm understating it, and uh, through all this, it sounded to him like pure sin. Whether or not I had a moral objection to it, and I did, but that was not the point. It was that this was a scientific book. He was proud of its being scientific. And here was some completely unevaluated, potentially important stuff carried out to absurd uh, numbers, fractions of a second. It was irrelevant. It was, it was unworthy of him as a scientist. Fifty years after Kinsey first published Green's Pedophile Diaries as scientific fact, the Kinsey Institute has been forced to defend his involvement with pedophiles. 
Director John Bancroft accepts that the scientific reliability of Green's diaries was dubious, but believes Kinsey was justified to make use of them. Kinsey uh, made it clear in his writings that he saw his task uh, as finding out as much information about sexual behavior as he could. And he sought information from wherever he could find it. He also made it very clear that he did not see it as his role as a scientist to make moral judgments. I think that Alfred Kinsey uh, used this individual's data and shaped a chapter drawing upon it, uh, really um, disgraced Okay, his discussion, and elevated to the realm of scientific information, uh, you know, what should have been dismissed as unreliable, self-serving data provided by uh, a predatory pedophile. How did Alfred Kinsey, a respected scientist and devoted father, become so involved with a man like Green? The answer may lie in a personal war he was fighting a war against all moral and legal restrictions on sex. A war that had its roots in his own childhood in the slums of Hoboken, New York. His parents were very poor, and Kinsey's life was dominated to begin with by poverty, very religious, repressive, not just sexy in every way, drink, smoking, Methodist religious background. The family was almost friendless. They were so religious. There are examples of him praying um, to be allowed to stop masturbating. He remained religious until into his 20s. Um, he then lost his religion and he turned with fury on religion. He, he thought it was hypocritical. The, the, the repression, the frustration, sexual frustration he'd experienced as a result of his father's um, strictures. That anger remained with him all his life. Kinsey's close colleagues believed that this anger fueled his research. To carry out the research, Kinsey believed his key staff needed personal experience of a wide variety of sexual behavior. To ensure this, he encouraged them to have sex with each other. Uh, one night, uh, Kinsey he said, why don't you come down to, to, to my room so I went down and I, I immediately felt some tension in the air, which was quite different from anything I had experienced with him before. And it suddenly occurred to me that uh, Kinsey was, uh, was uh, preparing to uh, offer me the opportunity to have some homosexual experience. And I said, I don't think I want to participate in this and please, uh, uh, excuse me, and I walked out the door. But Kinsey's interest was not solely scientific. He had discovered that he was increasingly sexually attracted to men and had begun to live a double life. In public, he appeared to be a happily married, respectable academic. In private, he sought out homosexual encounters. But these were illegal, and he was forced to keep them secret. On the one hand, he had a wife, he had children, he had a career as a, as a respected college professor. On the other hand, he had sexual needs and desires that could not be met um, within the confines of middle class morality. That made him, of necessity, all right, cultivate two kind of parallel existences. Uh, the one the world saw, the one that was private, sovereign, and known only to himself. So when he builds a staff in which there uh, is some wife swapping, when he builds a staff in which there are some uh, you know, gay contacts, uh, he's doing it, I think, uh, out of needs that are both professional and private. To satisfy these twin motives, Kinsey secretly commissioned a series of explicit sex films involving his staff and outside volunteers. Clarence Tripp was his first photographer and became one of his closest confidants. I was um, a photographer from 20th Century Fox, and he said, oh, among other things, do make me some movies. I need uh, 2,000 orgasms. Of course, we never got to 2,000, but we got to hundreds. The types of behavior filmed kind of run the gamut. Uh, there was a lot of uh, just, you know, heterosexual copulation. 
there was masturbation. Uh, there was also uh, more than a little uh, masochism filmed uh, at the Institute. Kinsey, I think, wanted to use these films to, uh, you know, to study and to learn and to observe. Uh, that, uh, that motivation was, uh, was certainly there. I think also Kinsey has a personal interest in seeing the filming take place. For him, it's both uh, satisfying emotionally and it's also uh, important scientifically that the filming take place. But Kinsey had begun to realize this type of sex research would take a heavy toll on both him and his staff. When Kinsey first hired me to do pictures, he said, I want to warn you of something. As soon as we get you to photographing sex every day and paying attention to sex right, left, and center, pretty soon nothing will turn you on. Nothing in the area, nothing visual will turn you on. Because you'll lose all those sensitivities. As he immersed himself ever deeper in human sexuality, the effects on Kinsey were becoming difficult to hide. Torn between the demands of his public image and his private sexual needs, his behavior became increasingly self-destructive. A strong association developed uh, in him that in order to have sexual pleasure, he also had to pay for it in pain. Kinsey, on one occasion, circumcised himself with a pocket knife without uh, anesthesia or anything else. Uh, that, to me, is an act of a desperate man. It's, a, it's an act of, an, of a person whose private boundaries are starting to erode. In 1947, Kinsey sent the final proofs of his chapter on child sexuality for approval by the pedophile he codenamed Mr. Green. Much of it came from Green's child abuse diaries, which has called into question its value. The fact that it's only one person uh, in itself weakens its scientific value, but doesn't um, uh, remove it. Uh, we've known of a few people of this kind who have kept detailed uh, recordings of their sexual exploits over a long period of time. And to some extent, they may feel that they're justifying their sexual behavior uh, in the process of, of documenting it. And I think one has to be rather cautious about uh, accepting their information just at face value. Kinsey's critics say that whether or not the material was scientific, he should have reported Green to the police. But the Kinsey Institute rejects this. It's inconceivable uh, that one could do research in that way, give people guarantees of confidentiality, and then when they've given you the information, say, well, I'm afraid I'm going to have to report you to the police. That would be immorality in, in, in my book of the highest order. Some of Kinsey's other defenders claim that Green had long ceased to be an active child abuser by the time he met Kinsey, and so there was no need to report him to the police. But the Kinsey Institute refuses to release Green's diaries which could corroborate this. Only trusted Kinsey supporters are allowed access to them. By convincing them that I was not against Kinsey, but concerned to find out what he was really like, and as they got used to me and realized that I was honest and sincere, I did finally get into, I think, everything I could reasonably have expected. But Jonathan Gaythorne Hardy's notes, taken during his access to Green's diaries, suggest that the paedophile was sexually active until 1954, more than 10 years after he first met Kinsey. What does the highlighted piece mean? Yes. Well, you see, he may have done, but the thing is, Kinsey didn't use that information. It's quite possible that Green went on, in fact, I'm sure he did, went on having sex with everybody until then. But that was long after Kinsey had got the, the journals. 
Kinsey's critics believe his involvement with Green was morally indefensible, especially because the paedophile was probably still sexually abusing children. The only justification for defending Kinsey was that all this happened before. If Green was sexually abusing children to 1954, Kinsey's last book came out in 1953. That certainly would mean that all of that violence and all of that abuse was going on throughout the entire time Kinsey was collecting these data. Wouldn't it? Green was not the only pedophile providing information to Kinsey. We, we got him in prisons, a lot of them. Uh, because we had the prison records of these people, so we'd say, uh, give us a list of everybody in uh, San Quentin who's sent up on pedophilia charge, and we'd go after them. So we got a lot that way. Uh, then there was also a pedophile organization in this country. Uh, they cooperated with us, and some of them who were not, of course, not incarcerated, uh, they came and uh, gave us information. Not all of the pedophile information arriving at the Kinsey Institute in Indiana came from within America. There was a man in Germany who was a pedophile and he wrote Kinsey. And he was interested in information about pedophilia and he offered his own case history. Of course, Kinsey couldn't go to Germany to get it, but he, uh, he wrote him uh, questions in a letter and they carried on quite a correspondence. And uh, we were learning some interesting things about pedophilia in Germany, you might say. The pedophile was Dr. Fritz von Baljusek, a former senior Nazi party official. Before the war, he had been a stormtrooper. During the war, he had commanded a ghetto in an occupied Polish town. During all this time, and in the years that followed, he sexually abused hundreds of pre-adolescent girls and boys. He recorded the details in pseudo-scientific diaries in which he claimed to have masturbated and penetrated the children to assist their sexual development. At Kinsey's request, von Baljusek sent his diaries to Indiana. But then, one of his victims was murdered. So the police were looking for pedophiles, and they ran across him and decided he was probably the murderer. And so uh, as they went through his possessions, they found in his correspondence with Kinsey. So they said, aha, Kinsey must know all about this man. Uh, we've got to have Kinsey's testimony and whatever records this man sent to Kinsey. So uh, they got Interpol, the Inter international police on the thing. And they even involved the FBI and some other things. And they put an enormous amount of pressure on Kinsey to reveal this guy's uh, this, this, this stuff he sent. And he was also keeping a sexual diary, and they wanted his diary badly. And so Kinsey said, absolutely not. This is completely confidential, and you're not going to get it. We'll destroy it before we let you have it. <laughs> Von Baljusek was never charged with murder, but he pleaded guilty to sexually abusing more than 30 children. At his trial, the judge criticized Kinsey for failing to report such an active pedophile to the police. It is a criticism the Kinsey Institute rejects. I think people have got to ask themselves the question, do they believe that research into sexuality should be done or should not be done? Particularly research into sexuality which might be, uh, in some sense, illegal. But if the cost potentially is more children at risk of abuse, can that cost be justified? Can uh, consider the cost of remaining in ignorance. Unless we know about these behaviours, uh, we'll be in a much worse position than if we have more information about them. That was Kinsey's view. John Bancroft is adamant that Kinsey never did more than accept reports from paedophiles on their sexual activity. Kinsey didn't ask anybody to carry out any particular form of sexual behavior. He simply asked them to let him know of their experiences that they'd had. But at von Baljusek's trial, an exchange between the judge and the pedophile seemed to suggest otherwise. The judge said, I had the impression that you got to the children in order to impress Kinsey and to deliver him material. 
and von Baljusek replied, Kinsey himself asked me for that. If the judge's impression was correct, and if von Baljusek was telling the truth, it would be evidence of Kinsey's involvement in ongoing child sexual abuse. It tells me that um, von, von Baljusek, um, who was not a sex researcher, uh, got his directions as to how to do the, quote, scientific part of the research from Dr. Kinsey, that he was directed. Over the years, people have used their contacts with Kinsey's in a variety of ways. And it's not surprising that if someone's uh, uh, being charged with an offence, if they can bring Kinsey's name in, they will do, in the hope that it might uh, mitigate uh, their case. But Kinsey uh, was not responsible for what that man was doing, nor did he encourage it. The key to resolving Kinsey's involvement with child sexual abuse is in von Baljusek's diaries but the Kinsey Institute refuses to release them. However, for more than 15 years, Kinsey appealed to people of all sexual orientations to send him information. In at least some of these appeals, he seemed prepared to give instructions on how to record their sexual activity. Persons who have kept calendars or who are willing to begin keeping day-by-day -day calendars showing the source and frequency of their sexual outlet are urged to write to us for instructions. So many people responded that the Kinsey Institute has never been able to catalog their material and today has no idea who sent in which diaries but the Institute says it has long been expecting to hear from someone claiming to be a victim of Kinsey's paedophile correspondence. Esther White is the first person publicly to make this claim. Esther's family had a long-standing connection with Kinsey. Her grandfather attended Indiana University with him. But Esther came from an incestuous family. She claims she was abused first by her grandfather and later by her father. The abuse started with my father, I think, as a very young child. Um, probably about age seven. My father started a loving, concerned, petting kind of an affection. And when the opportunity came along, he took the opportunity to turn that from affection into what he called affection and love into a sexual relationship, intercourse, oral copulation, ugly things that I don't like to talk about. Based on what her father told her, Esther believes he was one of the pedophiles who provided information to Kinsey. My father actually did um, mail in some uh, questionnaires, um, I believe, to the Kinsey Institute about the um, sexual abuse that he was doing on me. At the very peak of when all the abuse was going on, there was a, a paper in a brown envelope, and it was kind of halfway out of the envelope. It was a, a summer afternoon, and I don't know why I remember there was a, a warm breeze blowing through the bedroom window. <laughs> the envelope had blown a little bit and I went to put it back on the dresser and I saw that there were questions there. And it was a whole series of questions with little boxes in front of them. And I read one of the sentences and I didn't know one of the words. And so I asked my father, what is O-R-G-A-Z? Oh, he says, that's orgasm. And he continued to explain to me what an orgasm was. 
And then I realized why he was looking at his watch. Um, because he was telling me to let him know when I felt an orgasm. And when he saw that I had seen this paper, he immediately said he had a deadline to meet and he had to send it away. So he put it in this envelope. I know nothing about this woman or uh, her father or grandfather. I have no idea whether there's any basis uh, of fact in what she's saying at all. Would it be possible for the Institute to examine its files and determine whether her father did send information to Kinsey? At this point, I can't say. We have a huge amount of information that people have sent to the Institute about their sexual experiences. Somewhere amongst that, there may be something relevant to this woman. Uh, but that material is uncatalogued, um, unordered, and um, I really have no idea how difficult it will be to check that out. Can you understand, though, why she would feel disturbed by the knowledge that that material may be residing here in the Institute? If the description is accurate, then I can see she, she could have some concern, yes. Yeah. But she can also rest assured that the material will be treated with great confidentiality. And uh, we will never reveal the identity of anybody involved to, uh, to anyone else. But from what her father said about Kinsey, Esther fears the details of her abuse may have been used in his second book, Sexual Behavior in the Human Female. In a section dealing with sex between adults and children, Kinsey claimed to have evidence that children can enjoy abuse. The adult contacts are a source of pleasure to some children and sometimes may arouse the child erotically and bring it to orgasm. It is difficult to understand why a child, except for its cultural conditioning, should be disturbed at having its genitalia touched. But for Esther, some memories are so painful, they stand out even 50 years later. My school was going to have a little operetta. When I got on stage, I was so scared because I knew what was going to happen on the way home. My father put me in the back seat and, of course, continued to sexually abuse me. But I looked out the back window and there was a a gorgeous, beautiful moon and stars. And it's very difficult to say. I'm sorry. It was a very painful memory to remember. But I was crying so hard that the tears were running into my eye, out of my eyes and down into my ears. And I was crying and my sinuses were so filled up I couldn't breathe. And my ears were filling up with water. I have and I just had a fear, I'm, I'm going to die. Surely the way to get information on children's sexuality is not by asking men who have a vested interest in saying children are sexual and they enjoy being sexual. Nobody has said that the best way of getting information about childhood sexuality is by talking to paedophiles. Kinsey didn't say that. He simply reported some information of that kind because he thought it was worthy of consideration. Based on Kinsey's writings, he approved fully and wholly of adult child sexual interactions, what he called play or interactions. Not only that, he recommended 
that uh, adults uh, could uh, effectively aid children in, uh, in better sexual lives by giving them quote-unquote orgasms at a very early age. Without help from more experienced persons, many pre-adolescents take a good many years to discover masturbatory techniques that are sexually effective. It is probable that half or more of the boys in an uninhibited society could reach climax by the time they were three or four years of age. In his final years, Kinsey would testify before legislatures and courts that pedophilia was a less dangerous problem than public intolerance of it. Kinsey said some of the most brilliant things imaginable about that. Uh, pedophilia is an almost non-existent um, uh, kind of crime, and the thing that he hated most about it is that people use words like uh, child molestation. What is that? Nobody knows. Um, <laughs> the, uh, abuse of children? Are they talking about bollocks them against the ear or hitting them with a stovepipe? Are they talking about uh, tickling them a little? Uh, are you talking about fondling? You're going to put fondling and death attacks in the same group? As Kinsey said, by this kind of paranoia, you do the child more damage for life than all the pedophiles in the world would do. Pedophiles are very sad people. I think the fact that they're even taking the information from a pedophile perpetuates the abuse. It glorifies it to that pedophile. Esther White wants an independent inquiry into Kinsey's involvement with pedophiles, and an investigation of the child abuse diary is still locked inside the Institute. Those archives need to be opened up so people can understand that if they feel they were connected with the Kinsey Institute, that they can go back and know for sure. But Kinsey's surviving colleagues say their original promises of confidentiality make this impossible. We were asking people to put their careers and their marriages on the line by talking to us. To ask them to place that much trust in us, we had to be absolutely trustworthy. We were willing to go to jail if need be, or destroy the records if need be. We've thought about that on several occasions. What, destroying the records? Yeah. Because uh, I even thought about it recently when some of the politicians started getting interested in the Institute. And there was a senator in, from Texas that wanted a congressional investigation of the Institute and its records. <laughs> then there was a local senator in Indiana, Burton. He wanted the Institute investigated. You know, they all said, oh, you probably have, a, you know, case histories of sex criminals, and we'd like to get those records so we can catch these people, you know, that sort of thing. And when they start talking like that, then we seriously think, what would happen if we started facing court orders or if uh, search people came in with a warrant to seize what we had. Yeah, so we've made precautions. <laughs> what sort of precautions? We, all we have to do is destroy the code and some uh, card files and that does it. Then the case histories are absolutely unreadable. The Kinsey Institute says it will not destroy its records. It is republishing both of Kinsey's original volumes including all the material provided by pedophiles. Oh, they're going to be republished. I would like to stop that. I don't know how to do it, but I would like to do that. They used me, and they used those children. And that's a terrible way to feel, to feel that you've been used for a lie. 